Welcome to the Aging Adventure on KFOR, brought to you by the caring professionals at The Legacy with four state-of-the-art communities in Lincoln. The Legacy, Legacy Terrace, Legacy Estates, and Legacy Arbors. I'm Dale Johnson, joined by John Kopetsky of Legacy Terrace and longtime friend of Lincoln Seniors, Kathy Blythe. Good morning, Kathy. Hello, John. Good morning, Dale. Good morning, Dale. We go back in time for today's conversation on the aging adventure, tracing our ancestral roots, if you will. Genealogy, what is it? And why are we so fascinated about the people in our bloodline? Our expert is Marcia Stewart, genealogy instructor at Southeast Community College, to talk about ancestry when the aging adventure continues. Brought to you by Legacy Retirement Communities on KFOR. This is Kathy Blythe, along with John Kopetsky, and you're listening to The Aging Adventure on KFOR. Today, we're happy to have genealogy expert and instructor Marcia Stewart with us to let us know what's happening in the world of genealogy. A lot of people have caught on to this, um, I, for, well, I guess I could say obsession. Uh, it's a great pastime, and it's a great and wonderful thing to do for your family. Welcome to our program, Marcia. Thank you. Tell us what genealogy is. We think we know, but do we? Genealogy genealogy is a study of your family history and I think it's changed over the years I think people a hundred years ago were looking to be related to a president or Charlemagne or someone famous today we have the internet where we can find records we have DNA testing and we just want to find out who we're related to and what those stories are and that's essentially what genealogy is you mentioned uh, that you know it used to be uh, perhaps a lot more difficult than it is now with so many online resources. Talk a little bit about that and how genealogy has changed with the advent of the World Wide Web. Before, like maybe 20 years ago, you had to write letters to um, courthouses, to libraries, to archives, and you would have to hope that you found the repository for the record you were looking for. And it took for a long time, you know, snail mail. But today we don't have to do that. Records are online, so you can put on your jammies and your bunny slippers, curl up with your laptop in your living room, and you can travel the world and find a lot of records that will help you get started. And so you don't have to hire someone now, you can but you don't have to, you can actually get started yourself and find some of that information uh, to fill in the gaps of what you don't know about your family. Well, I've puttered around a little bit with genealogy. My mom was very much into it. Um, and I suppose I picked up some of that from her. Um, so I'm somewhat familiar with some of the websites out there, but for a person who maybe hasn't been involved in genealogy, what kind of records are available online uh, to, to look up and fill in those gaps? an amazing variety. <laughs> um, a lot of genealogists will start with the censuses because they go back to 1790 and the census is taken every 10 years and in about a week from now we will see the 1950 census out there and you will be able to see what your ancestors were doing at that time period. There's also a lot of church records, a lot of land records, Land records can tell you where your ancestor was at a specific point in time. There's tax records uh, telling you if they paid taxes. And of course, there's one thing, two things that are certain in life, taxes and death. <laughs> <laughs> so they will be paying taxes. Um, there's vital statistics or vital records out there. You, it's amazing the kind of records that you can find. And old newspapers are being digitized too, which is fascinating because you'll get to know who had a tea party last week and who was invited and what the, what the celebration was about. Absolutely. When, when mom spent all those all that time back in the 80s and early 90s putting it together, she went to the State Historical Society and looked up the local newspapers and came mm -hmm. up with all sorts of 
incredibly entertaining nuggets like that. Yes. that you know, so and so was a caller on Sunday afternoon, and just fun stuff like that that really gives you a, a, a taste of what it was like. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You can also look up gravestones on online. I think it's the site is called Find a Grave, and that is a, a, a treasure trove if the cemetery has been documented on um, date of birth, date of death, and who people are related to. Exactly. Uh, that's a, a site that was started by volunteers, and oftentimes you can see a photograph of your ancestor's tombstone, and volunteers can go on there and supply more information. So I have gone out there and connected my parents to their parents and their siblings. And so you can just follow these links through the website. And it's almost like following your family tree. So it, it, it really can fill in some gaps if someone has done that correctly. When we're talking about family trees, Marsha, I think all of us think of just the simplicity version of it where you've got the lines going about who, who belongs to who. But truly, especially in this day and age, we want to know more about those people, don't we? What they look like, what their illnesses were, if we were able to have that kind of information, what they did for a living. Exactly. I think that in in days past, people were just focus on that pedigree line, going back to Charlemagne or whatever. But today we really want to know what it was like. For instance, I have a great grandfather homesteaded in what is now Rock County uh, in the Sand Hills, north of Newport on the, on the Niobrara River in the days of Doc Middleton and what was going on then. So you have to know like the weather, you have to know the uh, geography, the social history, who was who, how they interacted. If there was a problem in the community, they went to the schoolhouse and discussed the problem. You have to really engage all of your history to understand and appreciate your ancestors. It's not just a pedigree chart. <laughs> how often you hear people say, I had great intentions of doing that and having those conversations with my loved ones while they were still alive and hearing those stories and it didn't get done and now I don't have the opportunity to do that. So this is good impetus for us all to have those conversations. It's hard to piece it back together again. That's what I did with my great grandfather. I had to go to the newspapers. There were no court records uh, for an incident that happened so, because the courthouse had burned down. So I had to study people's, like I had to read all about Doc Middleton. I had to read all about Moses Kincaid and all about Rock County uh, to piece and talk to everybody in the family to piece together one man's history. <laughs> Is, uh, is that how you uh, got your interest going in, in, in uh, genealogy or was it, did it predate that? Uh, it predated that, but that was the family that got me interested. Um, my grandmother used to tell me stories to bore me to death. So I would go to sleep at night and uh, it was the Turpin family. And my great grandfather was Newt Turpin and there was this fascinating story. And I started putting together these pieces and uh, that's what got me started. How far back have you traced your families? For myself, I have done work back into the 1700s, 1600s, but I have tied into some lines that go back to the 1500s because maybe they were rich or famous or something, I don't know, but someone else did that work, not me. And, uh, but I try to do it on all the different lines because the stories are fascinating. If you think you have a boring family, you haven't dug deep enough. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might find somebody you, uh, you uh, wish you hadn't found on some occasions too as well. <laughs> Well, my mother didn't want me to look at the story about my great grandfather because she was afraid of what I might find. But uh, it was a fascinating story. 
Well, for people who want to get involved in learning more about genealogy, they certainly have a wonderful opportunity with your class, uh, Marcia, at Southeast Community College. And you have another three-week one that will be starting on April 5th on Tuesday nights, 6.30 p.m. And all they need to do is call the program number at Southeast Community College if they want more info or to get signed up for that at 402 437 2700 and we'll give that information again before the end of the show but i would imagine that's a very popular class and i'm so glad you've kept it going and had such a wonderful response you're listening to the aging adventure on kfor brought to you by legacy retirement communities and we'll be right back is the topic today on the aging adventure on kfor brought to you by the legacy retirement communities john kapetsky along with our good friend kathy blythe and special guest marcia stewart today marcia i have uh i am reminded of a a, a school project my daughter did uh a, a beginning genealogy project and on it she wrote i am the product of a million yesterdays that I will pass on to a million tomorrows. I always thought that was a, a really great way of looking at genealogy. And how does one go about researching those million yesterdays that that produced us? How does a person get started in genealogy, Marcia? What can you can you answer that question for us? Yeah, I always tell my classes that the most important information that you are going to have about your family is what they tell you what your family, the stories that you hear from your family, because that is the seed to start your research. If you don't have that, uh, you are just wandering around in the wilderness. So it's, it's important to record what you can, start with your parents, start with your own immediate family and work backwards. Um, A lot of people want to say like, oh, I think I'm related to Thomas Jefferson. Let's go research Thomas Jefferson. But then you look at how many descendants he had and you have to research thousands of people to get an answer. But if you start with yourself, you're taking one step at a time into the unknown. And if you make a mistake, you can back up correct it and keep going out there into the unknown. So that's the best way to get started is to collect what you really know, the solid facts about your family. There are professional genealogists who will do that work for you. Or is that a very common uh, occupation these days? You know, it is. There's a website called APGen and uh, it's a list of professionals from all over the world and they are people who can do all the work for you, or they might be people who just, you can't get to France to pull that record and they will do it for you. They will go down to the local archives and get that record. Uh, So you can hire a genealogist to do a simple task or you can hire them to do write your family history or whatever you need. Have you done that type of work for people before? I have, yes. Um, And it's fun stuff because I have been working on my own family since I was a kid. And so sometimes that gets a little boring, you know, or you reach a dead end and you want something different. And so I get to help people explore things. And it teaches me about different areas of the country, different er eras of history and so forth, different stories. Marcia, not everybody may know that there are so many sites available on the internet. Some of them are free and some of them uh, one has a subscription to. How do you know which ones you should most gravitate toward if you are into a do-it-yourself mode? In my class, I, I recommend sites for people. And I always tell them start with the free ones. But whether you subscribe to something or not is really not important. Some people will do it just because they can. Some people are on a tight budget. 
that you can go to the public libraries and go into some of these sites. You can get to them from home. And I, I give people a list of places that they can go to find information. And I tell them what particular information they might get, like Ellis Island site or um, the newspaper sites or the grave sites and so forth. You know, you can start online and do it very easily. Several years ago, one day when I was bored, I Googled my name on, uh, on or Googled my own name on the internet and uh, found, out, found out there's another John Kopetsky spelled the same way, which is a fairly unusual spelling, who lives out in Colorado. He is my third cousin, a branch of the family that we really knew not very much about. And I saw his picture. He works for the school district out there. He is a dead ringer for my first cousin who lives uh, near Columbus. And and when I shared that with my sisters, they said that's exactly what Grandpa Kapetsky looked like, who, who had passed on before uh, before I was born. So you never know. I mean, just, just the simple act of Googling your own name can lead you on, on uh, to find some new information. Exactly. Googling is a research technique. <laughs> <laughs> Not everything you find on the internet is correct, of course, but a clue is a clue and you take a clue when you can get it. <laughs> My mom is a huge, huge uh, genealogy enthusiast and um, one thing that she's found, Marsha, which will not surprise you, is that because a lot of people in the families and the family tree input into a website what their knowledge is, just one wrong thing can send you like a whole different direction that's not right. It drives professional genealogists crazy because they may even have good intentions, but if they have it found the documentation to prove that this is correct. Um, you can, you know, like John Kopetsky, there's two of them. <laughs> Marcia Stewart, there were three in Lincoln. And um, I have families, like there's a John Turpin in at least three or four in every generation. So which one is which? And you have to really be careful because it's easy to get the wrong information out there. And that can send, as Kathy said, send you down a rabbit hole somewhere. Oh, it does. It's frustrating. <laughs> Marsha, are there uh, groups in town that do genealogy or where you can swap ideas and that type of thing? Oh, yeah. That's the fun part of genealogy, too. Um, there is a local genealogy society. It's the Lincoln Lancaster County Genealogical Society. Right now, they are mostly meeting by Zoom, um, but it's not a stuffy society. I think sometimes you talk to people about these things and they think uh, dinners and formal dances and things like that. No, these are people like you and I who just want to get the stories and record them and build a family tree. Um, and two heads are better than one. You might hit a brick wall and someone else has been at that exact place and they can help you solve that problem. There's people who have um, some expertise in like translating German script into English uh, or researching Irish records and so forth. So it's helpful to know who your friends are who can help you. Are there forms also available through the group that people can use? Yes, you could do that, but if you go on to Ancestry.com, they have free forms that you can download that you can start filling out. And there's all sorts of forms, um, pedigree charts, family group sheets, um, research logs, and so forth. Well, this is your chance, Marcia, before time gets away from us, to let us know what all you will, just an overview of what you'll be covering in your three-week class starting April 5th. I am going to start with the absolute basics. What is a pedigree chart? And then I'm going to explain what a family group sheet is to, to show the, the family construction. I'm going to show people how to easily document things and then how to go pull records to prove that what they think is true is actually true. And then how to go back to the next generation 
And then we start heading down the path to look at military records or land records, uh, passenger lists and so forth. Those specific things that people might want to get a little bit more knowledgeable about. That class is coming up at Southeast Community College starting on Tuesday, April 5th. It's a three week class meeting on Tuesday evenings. Uh, for three weeks, and you will be learning from an expert if you uh, if you take that class. Call 402-437-2700 to register. Marcia Stewart, thank you so much for being with us today on The Aging Adventure. Sure, it was fun. Thank you, Marcia. John, where do listeners go for information about the legacy communities? Hale, you can always call us at 402-436-3000 or check out our website, LegacyRetirement.com. Before we go, I'd like to remind you of our special event coming up on Thursday, April 7th, Tuesday, April 12th, or Tuesday, April 19th. How to deal with all of that stuff, hosted by our own Stuart Mitchell. To reserve your spot, call 402-436-3000. Thank you, John and Kathy. We'll look forward to our conversation next week. Join us on The Aging Adventure every Saturday morning, brought to you by the Legacy Retirement Communities. I'm Dale Johnson. 